but uh, I think that uh, we will start and uh, Paul will discreetly join the panel. So let me say that uh, I am uh, very moved uh, to be here because I was the <laughs> first president of the ESRB uh, at the moment where we were starting the ESRB <laughs> as an immediate uh, new institution created immediately in the crisis and from the crisis. And I have with uh, Francesco Mazzaferro a lot of uh, uh, good memories and uh, uh, tough memories on, on the creation of the ESRB. Uh, it is uh, a great privilege to, uh, Paul, you're welcome just here if you wish. Uh, it is a great privilege to introduce uh, this uh, panel which is a very, very, very uh, important one in terms of quality and experience and uh, vision of the members. So let me only mention the fact that uh, Pablo uh, has been in the ECB as advisor of the executive board as director general and is now uh, governor of the Central Bank of Spain and chair of the Basel Committee. So with an absolutely central vision of what's going on and what's going on, not only theoretically, but operationally. We have Stephen. Stephen, we work together in the BIS. Stephen, you are now, uh, you've been in the past and you're now in Brandeis University, chief economist of, uh, of uh, the uh, overall uh, um, BIS, uh, and also member, I think, of the uh, executive board of the, of the BIS. And, uh, uh, you have uh, worked a lot on all these matters uh, with uh, great, uh, great uh, skill, and I always appreciate it in, in the BIS, <coughs> our private discussion, if I may. William, uh, you've been the chief economist of the EBRD, chief economist of City now, a professor in various universities, including in Cambridge, and of course, author of a number of books. Uh, and Paul, uh, you've been deputy governor of Bank of England, uh, uh, you are presently uh, in Harvard, uh, in the Harvard uh, Government School, if I'm not misled, and your chair, which is even more, much more important, chair of the Systemic Risk Council and author also of a very important book recently. So uh, again, it's a pleasure because we will have some kind of multilateral vision uh, clearly in this uh, uh, panel. Uh, with various experiences and uh, various uh, vision, which are not alike, which is good. Uh, of course, Pablo will stick to uh, what is the present state of the art of what is being done in the Basel Committee today, and I think it's absolutely essential to realize where we stand. And in a way, Pablo, <laughs> the other speakers will really challenge uh, what, uh, not what has been done, I guess, but, but uh, what should be done. Are we done yet? And I, I suspect that they will say, no, uh, we are not done yet, uh, and perhaps uh, with various nuances. Let me only myself, having experienced uh, the crisis at its very beginning, and again, the ESRB has been created because we had a crisis in 07, 08, 09, 10, 11, uh, and uh, that was uh, uh, very, very impressive, I have to say, to realize that we were in the worst crisis since World War II without realizing that uh, it was really the worst crisis since World War II. I remember myself when we had the start of the crisis in August 07 with our money market out of order, exactly like the <coughs> New York money market is a little bit out of order. It was the same phenomenon, and we had to inject uh, 95 billion euros uh, the first day, and then uh, something like 70 billion the next day, and then something like 50 billion the day afterwards, all in terms of uh, full allotment, uh, uh, because we uh, didn't want to limit the uh, delivery of, uh, of uh, uh, liquidity. And uh, I uh, happened to say afterwards, uh, don't, don't be misled, this is not a crisis, this is a technical <laughs> issue. <laughs> we took technical decision to solve a technical issue, and uh, uh, I pronounced the word crisis only after Lehman Brothers collapse. But now with the benefit of the hindsight, we see clearly that it was something which was big, and uh, 
And uh, it reminds me a little bit, again, uh, what, ha what happened recently, which is a little bit of a wake-up call yeah. on what perhaps could happen. That being said, let me also mention, as part of a very rapid uh, uh, review of uh, my understanding of what, is ex what are the main characteristics of this uh, materialization of the systemic risk when it comes, it's multidimensional, its unfolding is always nonlinear. The contagion might be extraordinarily rapid, and we have to be prepared for that. And uh, the, all the decorrelated indicators or asset classes or whatever, or markets that uh, were observed before this materialization of the systemic risk are brutally, sharply, abruptly recorrelated. And you are in a totally different universe. Uh, and that, that is something which uh, we have to remember, it seems to me, uh, because it's a characteristic, again, of uh, all the situation where you have a materialization of a systemic risk. Uh, I remember that when we had, we, we had, of course, a lot of uh, observation when we were in the full-fledged crisis after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, but after this event on our money market, the 9th of August 2007, I remember what struck me the most was that the overall spreads, Eribor OIS, that was at a very low level before that phenomenon, was sharply, abruptly, as exactly a, a phase uh, transition that you observe in physics. Uh, we came from quasi zero to something like uh, 60, 70 basis point. And uh, for me, it was the first <clears throat> time I could see in finance something which was behaving like that. Overnight, a change. Of course, we had the control of our market with the uh, supply of liquidity without any limit. We could control the market and we avoided a disruption of the market. We avoided uh, skyrocketing of the interest rates, which was uh, threatening at the very beginning. But still, we had something that had profoundly changed. The spreads on that market were different, totally different from one day to the next day. So I draw your attention to this phenomenon of what I would uh, call phases transition by analogy to what we are observe in physics. Now, uh, I... Uh, would say that perhaps uh, the audience, as well as myself, are, are expecting that we have elements of response to a number of questions that uh, it seems to me uh, uh, are uh, very important. I don't expect that uh, the response would be the same, or even that uh, uh, we would, uh, and the speakers will all agree on that, on the contrary, because the, the multidimensionality that I mentioned as a main characteristic, of course, supposes that we have very different views and uh, we can rely on very different angle of vision. That being said, to make a long story short, I would say I would be myself very happy to have elements of response on the following questions. First question, to which extent should we be worried by the high level of global finance leverage, continental finance leverage, in Europe in particular, national finance leverage. I know that the ESRB is very keen on that and has addressed the question of real estate and uh, the leverage that we are observing, the financial leverage that we are observing in this domain. I, uh, I would say that I am at the level of the entire globe uh, very, very afraid to see, and I tell that to Pablo particularly, to see that the, uh, uh, I would say, overall uh, debt outstanding as a proportion of GDP continued to go up and up and up after the crisis, more or less at the same pace as before the crisis. And uh, this seems to me very worrying, particularly in a universe where a lot of uh, some economists and a lot of uh, market participants are saying we are in a situation where interest rates are so low that there is absolutely no point in being prudent and cautious as regards uh, leverage. You can leverage a lot because the interest rates are low. And it reminds me exactly what I heard when we were telling in the ECB 
uh, governments and, uh, and the European institutions, well, we see that uh, leverage continue to go up and up and up in some segment of markets and in, um, in some countries. And uh, that, at a time, will prove devastating. And we started to say that in 2005. At the time, we were not heard. And you might remember that in 2003, even the, the big countries in Europe decided uh, to reject the Stability and Growth Pact as it was at the, at the time. So I don't insist more, but this is a very important point, it seems to me. You discussed already a lot on shadow banking. It would be my second question. Does shadow banking uh, in structure, uh, as well as in size now, constitute a systemic threat for financial stability? Uh, I am very, very impressed by what was has been already said, but do we have the regulations, the prudentials that would permit to take control of uh, the embedded risk uh, of materialization of a systemic risk that are in this uh, 120, 130 trillion dollars that are in the global market in the form of uh, other financial intermediaries. Another question, which is a regular question, is are, uh, the, is the global imp implementation of prudentials correct, fair, do we still have regulatory arbitrage? Another question would be, in Europe in particular, do we have national prudentials that are adding up to the uh, European prudentials and the global prudentials and are creating particularly difficulty for the banking sector or the financial sector in general? I suspect that we have there a real, real issue. And uh, uh, if we could have some views on that, I, I think it would be very good. Another question, of course, is that uh, it's excellent to try to prevent uh, future crises, future systemic crises. It's the job of the ESRB. Are we equipped to deal with the crisis? Are we equipped to have an appropriate crisis management when the crisis comes? The crisis can take various forms, of course, but we are sure, we don't know when, that there will be a recession in the US. We are sure, we don't know when, that we, at the time, probably we'll have a recession in Europe by way of contagion. We are very sure that we would have market corrections at a certain period. We don't know when, of course, all this phenomenon will happen, but are we equipped? to deal with them, not to speak of, a, 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 I would say, more dramatic or a demanding crisis. Uh, another uh, series of uh, very important questions, but uh, of course uh, we are limited in time. I would be very interested to hear more on the embedded procyclicality in the system. Are the accounting rules perfect or pro-cyclical in some respect. Are the rating agencies perfect and well controlled or uh, potentially pro-cyclical in many respects? Are our prudentials carefully non-pro-cyclical? Uh, and there are a number, of course, of other questions, including, and that would be my last remark, uh, the question which is very important to know, and I think that academia has to work a lot on that, uh, which kind of new emerging properties are coming from the financial system, the global financial system, with the combination of IT and uh, technology, technology surges on the one hand, and the globalization on the other hand, which uh, might create new phenomenon. We discovered clearly that immediate contagion was a, a new property of the system in 08, 09. We, we did not realize that things could go that rapidly. Uh, we also discovered that uh, sudden stops were things that could happen. And uh, we were not really prepared intellectually to accept a sudden stop. And as I already said, phases transition, even without sudden stop, but, but uh, overnight abrupt change of the functioning of segment of markets or entire markets was also something which was, in my understanding, coming from the new combination of uh, globalization and uh, very uh, intense uh, utilization of um, IT and uh, new technologies. So these are a set of questions. Again, as I said, we are privileged because we have an extraordinary panel and I will give immediately the floor to uh, Pablo if he wishes.
So many thanks, uh, uh, Jean Claude. Uh, well, many thanks, uh, President. Okay. If you allow me, for those who have worked for you, uh, you will, of course, uh, always be uh, our president. Um, and also, let me thank uh, the ESRB Secretariat for the organization of, uh, of the event, uh, of this uh, conference, uh, also for the for the, uh, the invitation to, to participate in it. So, as uh, Jean Claude uh, was uh, announcing, uh, I will take profit of being the first speaker, and I will try to do the, the easy part which is uh, making maybe first at least a quick summary of uh, what uh, the, it has been agreed uh, on in terms of the financial sector reform during the last uh, decade. Although, uh, contrary to what uh, Jean-Claude said, I will also try to do some challenge uh, of, 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 my, of my own. So in this uh, slide, uh, what you have is um, I've put a, a list of the main post-crisis reforms, Basel III mainly, but also additional global bank uh, reforms uh, taken by the Financial Stability Board uh, in particular. Uh, let me go very quickly through, through it, but I think it could be helpful in order to put into context uh, the remarks that uh, will be made uh, later. So um, the, these reforms encompass first uh, higher minimum capital requirements, this uh, we all know, a revised uh, definition of capital with uh, a greater focus on truly loss uh, absorbing capital through common equity uh, tier one in particular. The explicit introduction of a macroprudential dimension, I think this is particularly uh, relevant uh, in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, context of course and in this uh, conference in particular, most notably through the introduction of capital buffers and some of them are uh, also listed in the, in the, in the slide. A comprehensive review uh, of, uh, to the risk-weighted framework was, uh, was done with uh, basically two aims. First, to enhance the robustness and risk sensitivity of both the standardized and also the internally model approaches. And second, also to incorporate uh, new risk. Uh, some of them are also listed in the, in the slide. The introduction of a leverage ratio requirement to complement uh, these uh, risk-weighted uh, weighted capital requirements uh, and to act as a safeguard against uh, unsustainable uh, levels of uh, leverage. A revised uh, large exposure framework to mitigate excess, excessive concentration risk was also uh, agreed, and this also incorporates a macroprudential dimension on it by imposing uh, higher, uh, tighter limit for intra GCP exposures. Um, for the first time, we now have a set of international liquidity requirements uh, covering the liquidity coverage ratio and also the net stable funding uh, ratio. Uh, in addition to all these Pillar 1 revisions, the committee has also substantially revamped its uh, Pillar 3 uh, disclosure requirements, which now cover a broader set of risk and a broader set of, uh, of information. And of course, we cannot uh, forget that uh, uh, the Financial Stability uh, Board uh, has complemented this reform by introducing uh, a set of uh, total loss absorbing capacity requirements for uh, GSIPs. So, um, I guess uh, we all agree that these reforms have translated into a banking, global banking system which is now more resilient than it was uh, in the past. And let me just give uh, some numbers uh, to illustrate uh, this point. So since uh, 2011, uh, City One capital resources for international active banks has increased by 85%. Banks holdings of high quality liquid assets have increased by over 60%. The average uh, tier one leverage ratio for banks has increased from 3.5% to 5.8% in the same uh, period. The average uh, city one risk weighted ratio has gone up from 7.2% uh, to 12.7%. And of course, we have also to take into account that the Basel III reform is, all, uh, is uh, in a transitional period still, and we have the, the transitional period till 2022, so uh, these numbers are likely to continue to increase over the next uh, few uh, years. So, this is what we've done. Uh, the question uh, that uh, Jean-Claude uh, was, uh, was making uh, in his introduction was, to what extent is this enough or not? And well, there are many possibilities to try to answer this question. One possibility is, of course, to look at the economic literature. Uh, and in particular to the economic literature on optimal capital ratios or perhaps more precisely on the marginal macroeconomic impact of higher capital uh, ratios. And this is what it is uh, I've tried to illustrate uh, in this, uh, in this uh, slide. Uh, and of course, what I will try to do is to compare the results of this literature with the, uh, the, and compare it with the Basel III uh, framework in order to reach uh, some 
conclusion. By the way, this uh, chart is taken from a recent paper that was published by the Basel Committee, which basically what uh, it does, this paper, is to summarize all the literature on these optimal capital uh, ratios. So uh, as you can see, what you have in the, in the slide, in the horizontal uh, uh, axis is the different levels of capital ratios, and on the vertical uh, uh, axis, what you have is uh, the net benefits of uh, these different capital ratios measured as uh, basis points of uh, over GDP, depending on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the paper. Of course, the, the, the reference is also different. I will not enter into the details because the papers are not fully comparable. Some of them look at uh, some definitions of capital, uh, other papers uh, look at other definitions of, of capitals. But as perhaps what it is uh, perhaps interesting to, to notice is that uh, these papers find that the net benefits are positive over a very wide uh, range of capital uh, levels, uh, which go for uh, since 7% uh, to around 16% uh, or even higher numbers uh, of around 20%. Uh, so where does Basel uh, three fit in these uh, estimates? Uh, so taking a step by step, as it is done with these uh, uh, vertical uh, lines uh, that you find in the, in the chart, uh, we can start with the Basel three, 4.5% minimum uh, city one uh, requirement, which is clearly on the lower uh, end uh, of the studies. But uh, adding the capital conservation buffer take us closer to the midpoint of uh, these studies. And if you then include the additional buffers for systemically important banks, and you assume, and this is important, you assume that the countercyclical capital buffer, the CCYB, is activated up to 2.5%, then uh, you can see that you are uh, well uh, within the range of the studies. And that this will be my main uh, first uh, point, um, that uh, the Basel III reforms are broadly in line with the range of estimates of, uh, that come from this uh, literature on optimal capital ratios. Or you can put it in a, in a different way. I think there is little evidence to suggest that we have overshot in terms of the, of the level of capital that we are requiring to, to bank, which I think is an important, an important point in itself. But of course, um, this uh, assessment, uh, and this would be my second message, message is, uh, uh, is based on the fact that the Basel III framework is implemented by all jurisdictions in a full and a timely and in a consistent manner. By the way, something that the G20 leaders are always emphasizing. And this is, a, again, a very important message. It's not only that we have agreed, but now it's important that we all implement these measures uh, adequately. And perhaps something that is uh, sometimes uh, forgotten or at least not uh, sufficiently emphasized is the fact that it also requires supervisors to carefully and continuously oversee the application of the standards. And I will try to illustrate this point also with uh, this uh, chart two in, in this new uh, uh, slide. So this uh, slide, what it shows is the result of a hypothetical portfolio exercise that was conducted by the Basel uh, Committee a few uh, years ago. And basically the exercise, what uh, it does is uh, banks were asked to calculate their capital requirements uh, for the same set of hypothetical bank and corporate portfolios, okay? Uh, and the result that you can see in the chart is, uh, I think it's quite telling uh, in the sense that with this, there is a worrying uh, degree of excessive variability in the bank's model risk weights, which it is uh, the one that is measured in uh, these two uh, bars, uh, the, 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 the left one for, for the bank exposure and the right one for the corporate exposure. Of course, the Basel III reforms, what they have tried is precisely to reduce this excess variability. But my point is that uh, the reforms will only truly uh, be successful if supervisors actively and continuously monitor the implementation by banks. And this microprudential dimension and the importance of the microprudential dimension of supervisors is sometimes uh, not, uh, is, is, is not uh, sufficiently uh, emphasized. So let's um, assume that uh, we all implement uh, the standards. Let's assume that we have also uh, micro supervision that is sufficiently rigorous. Uh, still, we uh, have to make the question, and it is legitimate to make the question uh, whether um, we are done or we are not done. Um, and in order to, uh, to answer such a question, uh, my uh, answer, which is probably not an answer, is that we need to take a step back and carefully evaluate the effectiveness and impact of our post-crisis reforms. And uh, in this uh, table, what I'm uh, basically uh, trying to describe is the work that the Basel Committee is currently doing in terms of the evaluation of the different standards. The Basel Committee is uh, currently embarked in a very comprehensive evaluation work that uh, incorporates an evaluation of individual reforms 
that uh, incorporates also an evaluation of the interaction and coherence of the different reforms, and that uh, it also incorporates an evaluation of the macro impact and the structural changes that these reforms might uh, require. And maybe we, before try, uh, trying to anticipate one of the uh, comments uh, that mm -hmm. probably uh, Steve will make uh, later, uh, I think it's important we, the, also the academics uh, are join us in this uh, evaluation. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, this will uh, improve a lot also the legitimacy of the whole uh, of the whole uh, of the whole process. So, uh, of course, I think we have to be honest on the results of these reforms in the, in the sense that if, if we find that there are side side, some side defects of the reforms that we were not expecting, we should, of course, look at them and try to modify them if, if necessary. And, uh, of course, if we find that there are some regulatory gaps that were not taken on board, at the very beginning, we have uh, to also to take them uh, on board in our uh, discussions. But one point that I wanted to also to make uh, I think it's uh, also uh, important uh, in the current context, and it was also emphasized by President Trichet uh, before, is uh, um, that uh, I think what we should avoid by all means is uh, uh, the well-trodden regulatory cycle. Um, so the fact that uh, where memories uh, of the crisis start to fade over time, vested interests start to grow, and um, the temptation to water down standards is, is, is there. And there is some evidence that this already happened in the past, and this is what I'm trying to illustrate in this chart uh, three uh, in this uh, new uh, slide. Um, what you have uh, there is the simple leverage ratio uh, measure, for example, of uh, internationally active banks, okay? Uh, and uh, it is normalized in the year uh, 2008, which is the year of the crisis. And what uh, you can see is that uh, before the crisis, so between, uh, in the slide between 2000 and 2008, banks' leverage ratio fell by about 15%, then to increase after the crisis by uh, almost uh, 40%. Uh, of course, these changes uh, are uh, also a reflection of the cyclical conditions, no? something that uh, Jean-Claude was also emphasizing in, in his introduction, but I think there is also, they also highlight the dynamic uh, of a regulatory pendulum. That the, my, my message here uh, is that we should try to avoid uh, now. And then uh, maybe uh, last uh, remark, and with this I will end, and I, ha I can be very brief because the conference has devoted the last uh, two, uh, two uh, panels today uh, to these uh, two issues that I wanted to, to emphasize. Of course, it's very important, and the, and the Basel Committee is, uh, is indeed uh, uh, focusing very much, not so much on the, the past risk, but the risk that are emerging. Um, and I will try to emphasize at least two of them that uh, on which uh, at least myself I'm, 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 re I'm relatively uh, uh, worried. The first one is the one that is illustrated in this chart. What you have there is the share of the banking system assets in total financial institutions assets. And the message is very uh, clear. Uh, Jean-Claude was also emphasizing this uh, at the very uh, beginning in his introduction. Um, what you can see is uh, that uh, the, 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 the banking sector is uh, reducing, let's say, its share in the total financing of the, of the economy. Uh, and of course, uh, this means that we have to ensure that risks are not migrating to the shadow uh, economy, uh, to the shadow uh, banks that are subject to less stringent regulations, as uh, we perfectly uh, know. And for this, what it is very important is that we closely uh, monitor the regulatory uh, perimeter uh, of the banks, and also that we guarantee that the principle of same activities, same uh, risk, same regulations is, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is guaranteed. And then finally, and just uh, with this I will, I will end uh, my initial remarks, uh, another important element is all this technological risk. And uh, uh, I can also be very brief uh, because the keynote speech that was given before uh, this panel uh, was concentrated on, on, on this. Um, but here is just uh, one uh, way to illustrate the, the issue. If you ask uh, the bank chief six officers what are the main uh, important new risks that are emerging, uh, well, you, what you find is uh, around 80% of them uh, find that the cyber risk is a top issue requiring the most uh, attention as compared to only 10% uh, five uh, years uh, ago. So uh, again, the, the Basel Committee is uh, actively uh, working on this topic and is, uh, in, in general terms, is working in a broader operational resilient issues, including, the, of course, cyber risk, financial technology, and crypto assets, and I think this, this is uh, well uh, justified. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, uh, it was, uh, Pablo, it, it was striking, and uh, I'm sorry to be obliged to compress the time. Uh, let me only mention also, because it came uh, in the occasion of the crisis, that the Basel Committee was 
the privilege of the industrialized uh, advanced economy for a long period of time, and then it opened up to the emerging systemic countries. And so that it is really a global entity today. And that is one of the major lessons of the crisis. But now, Stephen, we turn to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by, uh, by thanking President Trichet again, if I may. Uh, and also, I think that uh, what many people in this room may not know is that, um, at least in my mind, you and your role as chair of the governors and heads of supervision that oversees the Basel Committee are in many ways responsible for the fact that Basel III exists today. So I think we all owe you a Bravo. tremendous Thank you. thanks for that. Uh, and uh, having seen that close up, I, yeah. will, I could tell you <laughs> stories. I could tell everyone stories about <laughs> President Trichet's role as a, a, in that and how I, do, I really truly do not believe we would have this agreement uh, today without your, uh, without your, your incredible work. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, it's obviously my privilege to be here. I want to thank the, the, um, the ESRB Secretariat and the members for including me in the Advisory Scientific Committee. Um, uh, I, uh, I obviously know, I agree with, uh, with the, many of the implications of Governor Hernandez de Cosa that, uh, that the reforms over the last decade have been critical in making the system more resilient uh, than it was a decade ago. It is more resilient. But the question is whether it's enough and, uh, and where do we still have work to do? These are the questions that we ask. Um, this is a sort of question that Patrick Bolton, Jean-Pierre Dantin, and Xavier Vives and I set for ourselves about a year ago. And we produced a report, the name of which I have on the slide here, uh, which is actually relatively long. It's the first in a series of the future of banking that's being produced by the banking initiative uh, of the ESA Business School in Barcelona. Um, so if you want to know the details, they're there. Uh, in the few minutes that I have, I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about Basel III a little bit, a little bit about resolution, and then a minute about, uh, about the role of central banks. <laughs> So first of all, here's the picture uh, which has the data that Governor Hernandez de Cos was mentioning. Uh, here you can see the rise in both the risk-weighted uh, capital ratios for a consistent set of banks that comes from the uh, twice-a-year quantitative impact studies of the Basel Committee. Uh, and the red line is, is the the equal weighted leverage ratio. Um, I actually, uh, I, I, I'm a regular reader, you, you know, I, I seem to have time on my hands of the quantitative <laughs> impact studies. Um, after you've been reading for, for as many years as I have, you sort of know where to turn in the things to look for the critical bits. Um, what's very troubling in this is actually the downturn at the top uh, that, that we're seeing now. I, I think that uh, what we're seeing is uh, some evidence of forbearance and it's fairly uniform. This is a global, mm -hmm. these are global numbers. Um, now, uh, um, but in looking at this, I wanted to emphasize that there's been this big increase in, and there's also been a huge increase in requirements. Uh, the, the Basel Committee changes, which, were, which you heard about just a few minutes ago, have, have dramatically increased requirements. It sort of looks like they've only gone up from maybe four to seven or eight or nine, but they've gone up way, way more than that because of the yeah. changes in the definition. Absolutely. And so I think it's, it's important to understand that Basel II, if you computed on a Basel III basis, had a risk-weighted requirement that was vanishingly small, below 1%. Below 1%. Uh, I, I would say probably even less than that. Yeah, so here I think there's been serious progress. The question is whether or not the new levels of capital are enough. Um, and uh, have we overshot? Um, and, and, and here I think that we want to think about uh, two things. Uh, I don't have an answer to the question. One of them is that we've created these requirements for subordinated debt, which are really quite stringent. And so in many ways, we've substituted higher, instead of having high capital requirements, we now have subordinated debt instead. Now, maybe we should change, uh, m for my own taste, we should change the balance a bit towards capital, which is really the ultimate absorber of losses um, as well. 
and, and so I, I think we, we haven't done quite enough here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about liquidity requirements for just one minute, and if you'll bear with me, um, these, are, these are completely new, and in terms of, uh, of the construction and implementation, I would say that we're really finding our way. Uh, there was some discussion of that by one of, the, uh, one of the prize winners earlier, where there's theoretical work that's ongoing. I have a very simple balance sheet construction that I wanna show you. Um, and, um, so if you look at this simple example, I want to think about a stripped-down balance sheet of a banking organization where assets can be divided into just two categories. They're either liquid or they're illiquid. I should be able to do this um, for anybody. Then I can also, I mean, yes, there's degrees and stuff, but let's just assume we can do this. Um, and then, uh, then assets, uh, so assets are liquid or illiquid, and then, uh, and then I have liabilities, and liabilities are either runnable or stable. Um, again, I should be able to do this. If they're off balance, balance sheet exposures, for all of you that spend your life worrying about those, we'll convert them to on balance sheet equivalents and we'll put them in there somehow, okay? So the Basel, the Basel III framework has two liquidity requirements. It has something called a liquidity coverage ratio and then the net, net stable funding ratio. Again, one of the prize winners mentioned this. One of them says liquid assets have to be greater than runnable liabilities. The other one says illiquid uh, assets have to be less than stable liabilities. Well, this is all great, except for the fact that there's a balance sheet identity, and the balance sheet identity tells you that assets equals liabilities. That's sort of inescapable. Um, and when assets equal liabilities, at least in this very sim simple stripped-down version, what I've got is that these things are kind of the same. Um, I mean, the exactly the same, okay? So, <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, so I should say that this exact correspondence is broken by the combination of the existence of off-balance sheet positions and the fact that balance, sh that balance sheets of institutions can't be cleanly separated quite the way that I have. There's stuff that's neither liquid or illiquid, and there's stuff that's not runnable or stable in these definitions. But the fact is that there's still going to be a condition that really tells you that you're only bound by one of these for sure, okay? Um, and so the question really in my mind is whether we need both of these. When we look at liquidity requirements, I think we should be thinking pretty hard about how they're structured. I understand how it is that the two primary capital requirements are binding different bank business models. If you come to me and say, why do I need a risk-weighted capital requirement and why do I need a leverage ratio requirement? I said, well, you know, I've got these guys and some of them have housing loans that have really low risk weights and I kind of worry about them and maybe, you know, and then there are these other guys out there that you, so I, th I can talk about that. I, I can explain the behavioral reasons for that. I can't do that here. Um, now, maybe it's just my lack of imagination, but, um, but I think that we have a job to do, and we have a job to do as part of what, uh, what Pablo said, as part of our evaluation, our post-implementation assessment, we have a job to do, and I think we have a really big job to do on the, on the liquidity requirements and understanding, in understanding what they're doing. And, and my, right now, what I would tell you if, you if you asked me is we only need the liquidity coverage ratio. We just need to make it work properly and it probably doesn't work quite properly yet. So there was a discussion, so in, in asking, the, and, and uh, President Trichet asked about this as well, uh, asked about non-banks, there was a whole discussion of non-banks earlier this morning, because um, uh, uh, as, as, uh, as Richard Portis said, we're not allowed to call them shadow banks anymore, because I guess they've come out of the shadows. I use it. <laughs> <laughs> they've come out of the shadows, though. That's why they're not shadow banks. <laughs> um, and um, so the, we know, um, that when we try to control an activity, people try to find a way to move it outside the perimeter of regulation, uh, and they're often successful. That's just a sort of that, that's just the way it works. This chart provides impl implement, uh, some information from the Financial Stability Board's monitoring exercise, and what it shows you is that globally, banks have declined in importance while non-banks have increased. Uh, so uh, the non-banks are the are, are the are the yellow things basically. Um, now, interestingly, there's a lot of regional variation in this, banks have actually slightly increased in importance in the United States where they were small to begin with. They've decreased in Europe. Um, uh, I do wonder whether this is really a problem for Europe. I thought that was an intended uh, move in some, of the, in some of the regulations that were being put in place, uh, at least in the capital markets in Europe, was to try and, and, uh, and create more, uh, 
uh, more alternatives uh, to, bank, uh, to bank finance. But that said, I think there's clearly a missing framework. So to answer the question that you asked, President Trichet, uh, we don't have a framework for controlling systemic risk that arises outside of the regulated banking system. The ability and willingness of authorities to do something about this very substantially across jurisdictions. Um, for example, in the United States, uh, legal authority is lacking and political will is non-existent. Okay, so in the United States, it's like we're dead in the water when it comes to this. Um, in some jurisdictions, you have much, much better systems. Um, but what we need, I think, is a five part, five, we need five parts. We need data. We don't have enough data to monitor. We need analysts to assess what's going on outside of the banking system and in these things. We need authorities who have capacity, uh, uh, both the analytical capacity and the legal um, authority to designate, regulate, and then supervise what's going on. Um, and um, I don't have much hope for this in the short run, but we do need to do that. Um, and this is, I think, what I would call activity-based uh, regulation and supervision, but activities not based on instruments, but based on balance sheet structure. Okay, so there was some discussion earlier about how maybe it's the case that, that insurance companies should be doing certain kinds of mortgage lending. That's right, but it's a question of whether they're doing the maturity transformation or the liquidity transformation that banks are doing. And if they're not doing that, then they're not banks. Um, so to conclude my whirlwind tour then uh, of Basel III, we need to take a holistic approach um, and think about these requirements all together. Turning very briefly, and I'm way over time, to resolution, um, here I think, uh, the purpose of resolution, um, the resolution reforms is to avoid sp and reduce spillovers, but banks are large and they're very complex. We have 20 banks at least with more than a trillion dollars in, in assets. Uh, most of these operate in dozens, if not more countries. Citi, for instance, operates in about 100. Um, and many of them have hundreds, if not thousands, of legal subsidiaries. So they're, they're quite complicated. They'll make excuses about how it is that they're, they're not really so complicated, but I'm not so sure. Um, so from the perspective of too big to fail, uh, reforms to the resolution regime are the most important, if you ask me. And the question is whether the framework's going to perform well or not, and I don't know. Mervyn King has, has half in jest suggested that one of the, it would be great if one of the GSIBs were to volunteer to fail for us and so we could test it out. Um, one of uh, I. Huh? <laughs> um, but I don't know if this is going to work. I should say that there is one insufficient, there is one part that's clearly insufficient in my view, and that, that remains the provision of liquidity and resolution. Not in every, in every juris, we do not in every jurisdiction have a mechanism for what in bankruptcy or administration would be called debtor in possession finance. Um, and we especially don't have it for foreign currency. <laughs> So if, you're, if the consolidated entity's home, if you have a problem there, you might be able to turn to the central bank. Uh, but if what you need is liquidity in, a, in, a, in another currency, it's harder to see uh, where you're going to go. So I think that's a, that's a very, very big hole, if you ask me. I mean, maybe the SPOE, the single point of entry stuff, is going to work. I hope so. I think you know, it's a great idea. Uh, but we do need liquidity provision. Uh, to finish, the role of central banks, I think here, since we're sitting inside of a, I guess this isn't technically a central bank today, we're in the ESRB, not the ECB, but you know, we can decide how we feel about that. But um, I think that there we've, we've gone, uh, central banks have been asked to, to do a lot of things. Here I'm encroaching on some of Paul Tucker's territory in his, uh, his excellent book on unelected power. Um, but they're not what they were a decade ago or 15 years ago. And as a consequence of the crisis, they've been forced to do things that they never thought they would, do, uh, they would have to do and that we never thought they were going to do. Um, and, uh, and, and they've done all of this in large part without a public debate yeah. uh, that would lead to, uh, to, uh, to us agreeing on the legitimacy of this. I think this is a problem. I think this is a huge problem that we face today. And I think that what, what's essential uh, to strengthen the democratic accountability of these institutions is that we have uh, this discussion. So to summarize, uh, I think the system is more resilient than it was a decade ago. That's great, uh, but we need to finish the job. I'm not sure we're done. Uh, on resolution, there's been tremendous progress, uh, but there are glaring gaps 
perhaps, and finally, to ensure democratic accountability, I think we need a clear public discussion about what the, right, what the appropriate role is of the central bank in our uh, societies, not just in our economy and our financial system, but in our societies. And if I, if I may I make uh, a, a one last closing point, uh, and that is that we've, we've improved the process dramatically of how it is that we do uh, regulation and we reform regulation, how we set standards at the international level. Um, in his role as the, as the chair of the Basel Committee, uh, 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 Pablo described a process that includes uh, the ex-ante assessment of proposed rules and their calibration, the monitoring of implementation and the post-implementation assessment, and then we should see revision. This is a completely new thing. It makes total sense, but before Basel III, this was not how we were doing it. But I will say one thing, and that is I do remember in 2009 sitting inside of the Basel Tower and saying, it took 10 years to get Basel II done. We can't let this happen again, but we did. It took 10 years again. It can't take 10 years again. <laughs> we have to be way faster now. And I don't, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but we, we must figure out a way to increase the speed at which we're doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Steve. We, uh, we, learn, we are learning uh, from uh, all interventions. Let me pick up what you said on the fact that the question of democratic accountability of the central bank was very important, that they took in the crisis uh, decisions that uh, uh, were extraordinary and uh, unexpected, at least uh, unseen. Let me mention a theory which uh, is interesting, namely, Independence of the central bank was designed to permit central banking to reflect on the medium long term basis and not being hampered by short term views of politicians. I'm oversimplifying. In the case of the crisis, the independence functioned exactly in the reverse direction. The central bank could do things yeah. <clears throat> that the political sphere would not have done. Yeah. Clearly, it's uh, the U.S. is a fantastic example yeah. with the top yeah. uh, program, which was impossible to decide uh, at, at the start and then uh, took time to be decided. And uh, the criticism of uh, what the Fed did at the time uh, was uh, based upon the fact that, as a matter of fact, the central bank was very bold. And it was necessary to be bold in the circumstances. So independence functions in uh, two direction, if I may, in some respect. And it was the same, of course, in Europe. Willem, could you take the floor? Yeah, thank you. I will use the pulpit, since I'm of Dutch extraction. <laughs> pulpit. <laughs> 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 okay. I will uh, spend some of my time. Uh, no, I don't need it. Um, uh, talking about a complement, a sense of supplement uh, to uh, financial stability, regulation, supervision in support of that, that is the role of the lender of last resort and the market maker of last resort, which has not been prominent uh, in, in the discussions here. Um, just very briefly, as regards the regulations concerning capital adequacy under Basel III and for solvency II for uh, insurance companies, they've mitigated the worst capital deficiencies for these institutions. I'm assuming here that the finalized base of three reforms agreed in December 2017 will actually be implemented in full. We still have to see that. And so it's very important to have the addition of the leverage ratio as an additional constraint on the size and composition of the balance sheet because uh, banks continue to use inappropriate proprietary risk models to compute risk weighted assets. And one should never trust these calculations. Um, despite the presence of these uh, counter cyclical capital buffers, I think the net operation of the uh, Basel III system is still likely to be pro-cyclical. Uh, something that we have to address. Um, it's important that similar capital adequacy requirements be imposed on all finance institutions that are characterized by high leverage and material asset liability mismatch in duration and liquidity. Uh, very little progress has been made here. Uh, this is one illustration of the failure of regulation to move from uh, regulating 
nameplates right, uh, to regulation, regulating admittedly institutions and legal entities or natural persons, but from the point of view of the activities or the risky behavior they're engaged in. And um, basically, if an entity passes the duck test for being a bank, high leverage, mismatch, right, then it should be treated as a bank, whether it calls itself an investment fund, a money market fund, an ETF, an insurance company, a pension fund, the treasury department of a commodity corporation, a private equity fund, a clearinghouse, or a blockchain-based peer-to-peer platform. So um, a natural and essential complement to leverage and asset liability mismatch portfolio constructions is to have a lender of last resort and a market maker of last resort to provide funding liquidity, respectively, market liquidity. Think uh, Northern Rock, like your bank that failed, but the Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG, and in the earlier crisis, long to capital management. None of those were banks. They all required uh, last minute bailouts. Very briefly here, something that hasn't been mentioned either. In the Euro area, uh, basically all Euro denominated debt, because there's no national sovereignty over seniorage, is foreign currency denominated debt de facto. Ergo, own sovereign debt continues to be treated as safe when risk rated assets are calculated for uh, new area banks, uh, banks everywhere, in fact. Many sovereign obligations are subject to non trivial credit risk and should be weighted accordingly. Uh, in addition, exposure limits or concentration limits should be imposed uh, for own sovereign debt and possibly for aggregate euro area sovereign debt exposure as well. There's no reason at all why Europe should wait for the rest of the world to come on board to some FSB-sponsored initiative here, because the situation in the euro area is unique because of this absence of sovereign control over seniorage. Um, uh, finally, then on, on this capital issue, financial engineering approaches to safe asset creation, securitization, pooling, and transferring should be encouraged through appropriate regulatory treatment of these instruments. I don't know why there is no action on that. It's not something that is hard to do. For me, the defining moment of the uh, great financial crisis came when the Fed created the swap lines with the ECB in December 2007, <coughs> and within one year with a dozen other central banks. They were heavily used between September 2008 and January 2009, with volume speaking as 585 billion. Right? It's uh, quite extraordinary. Without these swap lines, <coughs> much of the European banking system would have been destroyed during the great financial crisis. The, fact, the Fed effectively act, acted as global end of last resort. It is disappointing, and I'm worried about this, that during the taper tantrum of the summer of 2013, the Fed did not extend swap lines to the central banks of the emerging markets were in the eye of the storm. Yeah, I agree. And I very much hope that the Bank of England has access to all the necessary <coughs> swap lines if no deal Brexit materializes. Yeah. Um, uh, again, we have to hope that in the next financial crisis, the Fed will be willing and able to act in this manner again. In the absence <coughs> of the IMF taking on a larger role, which I think is unlikely, uh, the only pseudo land of last, global land of last resort is the Fed. Um, there has been technical regress in, as regards the ability of the key financial center, central bank, the Fed, to act as lender of last resort and market maker of last resort. Under Section 10A of the Federal Reserve Act, emerging advances to groups of member banks, extraordinary financial support, that is to member banks that have no access to adequate collateral, can only be provided by a Federal Reserve Bank to groups of five or more banks in its district. <coughs> so it's a case of hard luck if only the four largest bank in your district go bust. Extraordinary um, uh, post-crisis uh, self-inflicted wound. And Section 10B of the Federal Reserve Act, Act to individual member banks, effectively restricts such advances to institutions that are deemed viable by the Federal Reserve Bank in whose district they are located. And again, you cannot determine viability in the midst of a crisis. You first you know, uh, provide the liquidity, and then you decide whether they're going to be liquidated in an orderly manner or kept alive. Uh, it is, so there has been a weakening of the lender of last resort and market maker of last resort capacity of the most important central bank in the world. Um, 
Uh, the quid pro quo for unrestricted land of last resort and market made of last resort authority is full openness and accountability for all financial and other interventions by the central bank. In its proper time, I recognize there has to be a lag, six months, maybe a year, between the date of the central bank financial intervention, rescue, and the date at which all relevant information about the operations in the public domain. But there can be no compromising on the principle of full openness and accountability. And central banks have a terrible record here. Uh, the, the Fed had to be forced by a, a, a court case to provide information on how it's spelled out uh, uh, AIG. A, AIG and other large corporations. Again, not a proud moment. Um, liquidity. Liquidity is a public good. When there's optimism, confidence, fearlessness, and trust, almost every asset can become liquid. When there's pessimism, lack of confidence, fear, and mistrust, almost nothing is liquid. Funding liquidity shortfalls trigger distressed sales of assets that result in the vanishing of market liquidity for these assets. Only the domestic currency obligations of the central bank are the ultimate liquid assets in the worst case. Now, the purpose of banks and most other financial institutions is financial intermediation. Sent to this are maturity transformation, liquidity transformation, and risk transformation. And this should not be impeded by silly restrictions on liquidity. Uh, liquidity has to be provided by the land of last resort and the market made of last resort on a routine basis. I know the Fed has forgotten how to do this, apparently, judging by its advantage in the repo market for the last week. But uh, it is important that we uh, do not uh, request, as the NSFR request, uh, which is a front to economic reason, which requires the available amount of stable funding to exceed the required amount of stable funding for a one-year period of extended stress. We're dealing with a one-year period before a lender of last resort can get its act in order. This is completely crazy. So I'd say do away with the NSFR. Uh, the LCR is, is, is innocuous. It really forces you to hold no more than the liquidity you'd hold anyway for ordinary commercial reasons. Now, um, two final remarks, uh, which are not directly related to this, but the regulatory implications of climate change are uh, surprisingly on the in the vision field of many leading central banks. Uh, Marcani has been a leader in this field, and uh, there is a recognition that even if financial institutions don't have an ESG agenda, even if its objectives are constrained narrowly, to financial risk and returns, global warming will demand growing attention from the corporate leadership and from regulators and supervisors. So um, if, highly unlikely I think, but if adequate measures to limit global warming are implemented, stranded asset risk will be massive. Should, as seems more likely, global warming proceed apace, the massive physical damage that is likely to be the result will challenge the solvency of financial and non-financial entities that are exposed to it, directly or indirectly, whether through insurance and reinsurance or through cat bonds and similar instruments. Some progress has been made in this area, but I think it ought to be a standard element of uh, any corporate risk, including financial risk an uh, analysis. And then finally, on, on cyber risk, it is clear that the prevention and mitigation of cyber risk, both accidents and attacks by private and state actors, is becoming an integral part of politic, policies and regulations to maintain financial stability. The implication of cyber risk is that there's a growing need for socially inefficient but socially necessary redundancy or duplication in our financial arrangements. Yeah. And I think we have to yeah. be prepared yeah. to make real sacrifices in, uh, uh, on the cost and, uh, uh, and the prima facie efficiency side to get this redundancy and duplication. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much, William. Indeed, it was uh, very, very stimulating. Uh, I think that your presentation of the Fed being the lender of last resort at uh, the global level because we had the swap between the ECB and the Fed could be a little bit 
challenge because you, you could say the dollar being the global currency, there was a lack of dollar obviously yes. in the crisis, which after all was born in the US. And uh, the Fed was only taking a risk on the best central bank you could imagine with an enormous capital, gold reserves uh, of an immense magnitude. And the risk of the Fed was taken on the ECB and not on any particular bank that would be in a desperate situation. So I mentioned that en passant. Uh, I'm not saying they took <coughs> crazy risks, but they acted as a last resort. It was they had a good counterparty in Frankfurt. Doesn't mean that they weren't uh, <laughs> they weren't doing it. They yeah, still I need mean, to do it. I mean, when when you have the global currency yeah. uh, without disputing uh, that position, which is uh, again not really disputed. It entails a number of consequences. Absolutely. And this but OK, thank you very much indeed, Willem. It was very stimulating. Paul, you have the floor now. Will you take the... Can someone you stay on your up? armchair? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. sit here, if I may, um, Jean-Claude. While my slides are coming up, Steve earlier paid tribute to Jean-Claude's massive contributions as chair of the GHOS, which I heartily endorse. But, but also, it should be said, as the first chair of the ESRB um, as well. I was the um, Bank of England member of the ESRB um, because Mervyn King was the first vice chair. It, it's tremendously important that the president of the ECB takes the ESRB with complete seriousness. And um, I, I look forward to following that in the years to come. Francesco Thomas, thank you very much for inviting me um, again. Um, I'm going to say just a little bit about the state of play, and then I'm going to outline three policy proposals. Um, because I'm going to express dissatisfaction with the state of things, I think it's important to underline that I remain very proud of what our generation of central bankers achieved, both, both in terms of avoiding the Great Depression and in terms of making the system more resilient. But on, on, on the second, um, you really should take away this point that the system was horribly unresilient before. S Steve said that the, um, the Basel requirement was essentially under 2%. If you, under 1%. If you convert it into the implicit leverage cap, it was over 200 times. So basically, there was no equity in the system before. I would urge you, Pablo, to move in your term as office as um, Basel Committee Chair. One of my mentors, was the, George Blunden, was the first Basel Committee um, Chair in the 70s, to get rid of the term capital. Just talk about equity and debt that can be bailed in. There is an industry out there that it aims to exploit you, some of them in the room, in terms of AT1 and AT2, um, and it's a, it's a game. It's a game with private advantages and social, social costs. But more importantly, because the, the costs of financial crisis are so gigantic, and I'll say something about that in a second, the, the best approach for policymakers to take to it is one of, of dissatisfaction. There are some areas of public policy where you can declare an achievement. I think in this area, one should be constantly carrying around dissatisfaction. Why? If you think about the crises, just taking the 20th century and the early 21st, if you think about the crisis of 1907, late 20s, early 30s, and then the early part of the, 20th, 20, um, the 20th, 21st century, they're not just followed by economic dislocations and downturns, but by social disruption, cultural disruption, political disruption, even constitutional um, disruption. We have no idea yet what the long-lasting costs of 2007 through to 2009, 2011, 2012 are going to be. And I think most of the, um, the work that es estimates the costs of crisis doesn't get this at all. Because you have, to, you have to factor in into the costs all the bad policies that get adopted um, afterwards. So I'm first of all going to list some sins of omission then I'm going to be a bit more constructive. So there's no general policy on shadow banks. This is a very bad thing. There is no excuse for it. There is no resolution policies to speak of for central counterparties. This is even worse. 
particularly for legislators, whereas banks became too big to fail by accident, CCPs are too important to fail by mandate. I was part of that decision. I remain proud of it. There are not resolution regimes or plans to resolve them in a crisis. In some capitals, I think not in Europe, but in some capitals, some agencies actively, actively impede the development of such policies. Um, on resolution, I think there are issues in Europe, rightly or wrongly, the Single Resolution Board has not yet established a reputation, even amongst its peer supervisors and resolution bodies, that it, is, that it could live up to um, the challenge that it would have to face. And I, I believe in these SPO things, I'm one of the fathers of them, um, almost everywhere, particularly in the United States, but here as well, um, so-called internal TLAC requirements the things that move excess losses from subsidiaries up into holding companies have not been articulated um, and properly applied yet, but the directive in, the latest directive in the EU will help. In Europe, the common equity requirements um, do not take account of the fragilities in the macroeconomic framework. I think one can make a respectable case that where we calibrated Basel III, and essentially it was calibrated in 2011, um, that, it, that we didn't um, factor into that a world in which productivity growth was going to stay so low and so real interest rates were going to stay um, so low, and therefore nominal interest rates wouldn't have as much room for manoeuvre. That's a world where, where you don't have fiscal policy, as in the euro area, you actually need higher capital requirements rather than um, lower capital requirements. And finally, too many of the nation states, the member states of the euro area, are too fond of forbearance. Um, and I hope that the leadership of the SSM and the new leadership of the ECB will be really tough on that. So, three policy proposals very um, briefly. The first one could be implemented nationally or at a regional level in, in Europe fairly quickly. Um, the, the second and third, I don't think could be. Um, the opacity in, my, my generation of central bankers saw an incredible increase in transparency and monetary policy, um, which amongst other things improved the quality of public debate on monetary policy. I am reasonably knowledgeable about supervision and regulation. It is almost impossible from outside to judge when Sm the cumulative effect of small changes in regulatory policy and supervisory policy are, are having a material effect on capital requirements and liquidity requirements on banks. And this, this gives policymakers the capacity, and in some circumstances they have the incentives, to actually ease policy without anybody noticing. Um, in the short to medium run, or tighten policy. What I would like to see is every year that um, the chief supervisory and regulatory bodies, the ESRB could organize this for um, the, Euro the EU, would be to announce the cumulative effect on the capital requirements and liquidity requirements of every single significant bank by name of all the changes in regulatory policy and supervisory policy, including changes to the equations in stress testing models, which is kind of one of, the, one of the games, one of the games is those equations, what the effect of that has been. The, the second thing I want to say is, and this would take longer, that one, one of the ingredients of good policy making when the political window closes is to have your, eyes, have your ideas ready for when the political window reopens. The political window may not reopen for two or three years. It may reopen next month um, if there's a, you, and therefore one has to, here's, here's what I would like to see. I, I think we should move to a world, this is second stage reform, move to a world where policymakers are clear about which liabilities for asset managers, which assets, are going to be safe, for those of you that are economists, in the kind of Holmstrom um, sense of, of safe assets, informationally um, insensitive. I think that means two things. Um, first of all, I think it means that 
um, banks and near banks should be required to cover 100% of their short-term liabilities, say going out for a year, with the discounted value of assets that can be taken to the central bank in the discounted window. So, this, so to be clear, that could sound a bit like the LCR, no discount for retail liabilities because of stickiness, because they're not sticky in a serious run, 100%. Um, so the action would move to what, are the, what assets are eligible at the central bank window and what are the haircuts that are set by central banks on those, on those um, assets. Now, Villa may disagree with this. That is not going to work. Um, although that would be a big step forward, that's not going to work um, when a potential, bank, potential borrower is fundamentally insolvent. And Willem says you... Willem, Willem says something that Charles Goodhart says, you can't tell in a crisis. Sometimes you can't tell. Let me promise you, sometimes you can. Um, it's, it's this remark that, that a number of people make, you can never tell. It is not true. Sometimes you cannot. Sometimes you can. I've done it. And I've been in the room when other people have done it over many um, years. If, you, if a central bank, an independent central bank, lends to a bank that it knows to be fundamentally insolvent, it is essentially preferring the short-term creditors at the expense of the long-term creditors. The long-term creditors are made worse off. That's a fiscal decision. That's where resolution comes in. So we have a resolution policy, which I think is good, but I would, where when equity is um, ruled out, well, um, wiped out, the losses should go on these bonds that can be bailed in. I think that's great, and I think in certain circumstances that can work. A sane policymaker will prepare for when does the total TLAT requirement turn out not to be enough? And in those circumstances, if you assume that bailout is ruled out, the policymaker, this is going to be a political policymaker by now, is going to have to decide which creditors, after bondholders, it wants to put losses onto. Does it want to put losses onto trade creditors? Does it want to put lo losses onto derivatives counterparties? Does it want to put losses onto uninsured deposits from households? Um, from small businesses? Does it want to distinguish those from uninsured deposits from asset managers? This decision will be, will be in front of a policymaker somewhere in the world eventually. I hope not for a long time. And you should work out what your answer is going to be. I'm going to suggest two possible um, capital structures. And again, I think over time, the, the Basel Committee should be moving towards prescriptions and proscriptions around capital structure. One option would be common equity, then the super subordinated TLAC bonds, then which are issued to the holding company, then deeply subordinated bonds issued externally, then maybe any other senior bonds, then maybe um, obli other obligations with the re residual maturity of over one year, then maybe uninsured deposits from non-households and maybe derivative stuff, then maybe uninsured deposits from households, small firms, trade creditors, then maybe insured deposits. Of course, those would be last. Another one would be, maybe we should distinguish between senior bonds with a residual uh, maturity of over one year, and then other obligations with a residual maturity of over one year. The details don't matter. It's that somebody in this room, somebody young probably, I hope, going to have to confront this decision. Even if the bail-in plan is as good as Wilson Irvin and Paul Tucker says it is, um, this, this will be faced by someone like Jean-Claude Trichet um, or Mario Draghi or Jay Powell needing to go to see a Chancellor of Germany or President of the United States to say, actually, it's going to have to go further than that. Do you want to buy it or do you want to put losses on X and, and Y? Summing up, a lot of progress has been made. The system still isn't resi resilient enough. Part of the the reasons I've suggested. There needs to be more transparency on effects of changes in supervisory and regulatory policy. I think that'd be good political economy, um, good politics more generally. I, I would move towards 100% discount window cover for short-term liabilities. Um, I would be more prescriptive and proscriptive of banks' capital structure, not as a way of being tough on the banks, but a way of being realistic about the misfortunes that the world can encounter 
And for God's sake, please do something about shadow banking and, and clearing house resolution. The last two things should be a political imperative for your community because these were identified um, you know, nearly a decade ago as pressing issues. And the political world will not forgive again and the public won't forget the polit um, political world. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Paul. Again, it was a, a very, very important wake-up call in a way. Uh, you mentioned very, very eloquently the non-banks uh, issue. Uh, Stephen did the same, uh, William also. And of course, it is uh, something which uh, Pablo knows better than anybody. I was always wondering why there was such infuriation against the banks when we had a crisis, and of course, uh, in some uh, cases, uh, the taxpayer had to step in. And no, not much infuriation, apart a little bit against the Fed or against the Central Bank uh, of Europe or others, as regards uh, the intervention on markets. And my understanding is what was that the political economy was not the same because a bank is an entity that you see, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which has uh, shareholders, uh, managers, uh, CEOs, and so forth, when the market is the market. So uh, you intervene on the market. It's uh, less visible. It's uh, less uh, of an identifi a possible identification. <coughs> and uh, it, it's clear that uh, we were pushed rightly so, to improve considerably the credentials on the banks, even if a lot remains to be done, as you said. But it's true that uh, we were not pushed uh, with the same uh, vigor to see exactly what are the systemic risks embedded in the markets in general, say the non-banks, to oversimplify. But, okay, it's, it's, a, it's an open question. Uh, that being said, perhaps you would like to correct a little bit what has been said by all the speakers or engage in a very yeah. short dialogue before we ask questions. Yeah, sure, uh, sure from the, um, yeah. So I think, well, my reading at least, maybe I'm a bit uh, optimistic, is that there is a certain consensus no, on at least uh, some of the, of the issues that are still uh, pending. Let me maybe uh, just uh, make two remarks, uh, one of general one and uh, the uh, second a bit more specific. Uh, and related to to some things, uh, some elements that were uh, raised by by Steve, uh, but uh, I think also by, by by Paul. I mean, this I think because I think is is particularly important. So this democratic uh, legitimacy, you know, or accountability, or I think uh, I think this is this is particularly uh, important in the current uh, political political context. Um, of course, I don't have a, a, an explanation. Paul, you were suggesting well, to, to provide more information regularly on the changes or the implications of the changes in the supervisory domain, for example. Well, uh, it's, it's not obvious to me how this can be done practically, but uh, I mean, of course, it's yeah. something that we can, I mean, in the sense that it's not obvious, uh, it's very difficult not to, to, to even to identify the changes in the supervisory domain of one specific bank. But I mean, I guess that you've thought about it uh, much, much deeper than, 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 than me, so I'm not, uh, saying that it's a crazy idea. But uh, what I think is, uh, is, is, is important, and I think is, is already a response, at least is a response by the Basel Committee, as you were uh, saying, Steve, is uh, this evaluation framework. I mean, this is a new thing, that uh, uh, an international uh, setter uh, enters into an evaluation program for the following years, which basically, uh, the main uh, principle is that it's questioning the reforms that have been approved within the within the 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 the, 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 the Basel Committee, I think is already something that uh, uh, I think it improves a lot the accountability. At least if we do it in a very transparent and, hon and honest uh, way, and of course involving the, the academy, as I was also emphasizing in my in my remarks. And then just a second um, a second comment uh, on this. Uh, LCR and FR issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but you were also uh, emphasizing this, Steve. I mean, it's, it's true that the, the, uh, there is an issue there. You were uh, very clear, but also you were also very simplistic, and you were making this, this point. The balance sheet of the banks are much uh, more complicated. In the end, this is a, an empirical question. 
Okay? So we did some exercises uh, at the Basel Committee, an internal exercise looking at the banks, because of course if it is redundant, what you would expect is that banks meeting the LSR will also meet immediately the NSFR. And this is not the case. Okay? Uh, there are a group of banks that uh, meet both of them. There is a group, which is the majority of them, uh, around 85% of them. Uh, there is a, a small group of banks that do not comply with the uh, LSR, and there is a small group of banks that do not comply with the NSFR. <laughs> but, uh, of course, uh, what it is important is you get the data and you, <laughs> and you can't uh, uh, make the, the, the test uh, yourself. <coughs> Stephen? Just d directly on that point, I, 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 I'm aware of that. And, uh, but, the, but, uh, but I think that what the logic of this, these uh, simplistic, oversimplified balance sheets tells you is they tell you that you can then reform the LCR to make sure that this happens. So there just needs, you, you really only need one. Okay. Two very quick comments. Um, <clears throat> one of them, I, I think maybe back more to your original questions, uh, President Trichet. The first one is that the, about, about real concerns that I, I have. I think that, that uh, technology and finance is increasing, uh, is increasing cross-border sort of transmission of various kinds. It's increasing the need for global cooperation and global coordination on not just standard setting, but on the implementation and the uh, actual supervision but at the same time, politicians are going in the wrong direction. Uh, politicians are going towards less cooperation, and they're instructing their they're instructing their people to be less cooperative. So I'm very very worried about this divergence of the political system from the way in which the 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 uh, what technology is really forcing on us, and and how that's going to be resolved. The second point is uh, is, is I think Vellum made this uh, made this focused quite a, uh, quite rightly on the importance of the swap lines. Here again, I'm very worried. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm worried. I'm worried not. Uh, I, I'm worried that even the ECB credit will not be good enough next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I'm serious. It's politics. Again. I'm 100 percent serious. Yeah, it's it's, it's entirely for, politi for politicians. For, for, for politicians. Yeah. Right. And so what will happen is they will come and they will say, "Oh, you know, look, your banks are your problem. Uh, why should I give you?" And the fact that they that they have dollar that they have dollar assets and dollar liabilities, that's your problem. Um, and so there's no acceptance, I think, inside of the United States of the fact that this has dramatic benefits for the United States, and with those benefits come responsibilities. I think that's really, this is a really dangerous thing yeah. that's, uh, that's happening, and, and it's, getting, it's getting worse, not better. Yeah. It is one of the aspects of the U.S. Uh, sum in the, in the U.S. shooting in their feet. Yeah. to diminish and diminish and diminish yes. the use of the U.S. dollar. I mean, yes. I, Iran is another story, but... Well, it's, uh, we, we, could, we, we have a long list <laughs> <laughs> but on that, so... Other remarks, other... William? No? No. Um, waiting for questions. Okay, Paul. Let's go to... You were the last yeah. to speak in any case. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, could incorporate yeah. Uh, yeah. your reaction. So, who wants to ask question? Please, madam. This is a, a, a general comment to, to the uh, speakers. Um, and I would pose to you that uh, I don't think we've resolved the too big or too important to fail issue, and none of you mentioned that. Because if there's a full-blown crisis again, uh, I honestly don't see um, the, the financial uh, sector not being bailed out again. So. Oh, wow. Paul mentioned that, but you want to respond? Yes. Uh, well, I she's had not one, done. One, <laughs> one, yes. one of the comments. Uh, and that was uh, to both uh, Willem and Steve. Uh, you know, Willem mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, the IMF could be called upon during a global financial crisis, but we all know that we simply don't have the mm -hmm. sufficient resources. Mm -hmm. And that's why what you said is absolutely correct. The swap lines would be great if they were indeed extended to emerging markets. Uh, and there was a lot of pressure put on the US, for example. There was a lot of study done by ourselves and academics 
which showed there are spillovers. First, the US said there are no spillovers, so we did a lot of work, proved there are spillovers. So then the US came back and said, okay, we can only take it into account if there are spillbacks to us. So then they did, then the US, the Fed did some studies, and we did too, and we found there were very little spillbacks. So even if, see, what you say is not true, uh, or is true, the, it's a separate issue that, uh, you know, if they don't find, even if they were well-intentioned politicians, but if they don't find spillbacks, it's not going to happen. Okay, could you respond a little bit or comment on the, on the comments? On tribute, on tribute to fail, um, I, I don't know whether you take this view of it, but lots of people frame this question as though it's binary. We either have solved too big to fail or we haven't solved too big to fail. And I think this is an absolutely fundamental um, problem. And I must say some leading policymakers have, have encouraged this way of thinking about it. Think about it as circles of hell. And some crises are worse than others. Mm -hmm. And when I was devising the bail-in plans, what I had in mind was that the prime minister of my country or the president of the United States, the chancellor of Germany, their only sane choice wouldn't be bailout. It, but before I left office in 2013, um, late 2013, I made a speech in Washington where I very prominently said that I sincerely believed that already then the US securities dealers, if they failed, could be resolved through bail-in without the whole world financial system falling apart. I still believe that. I think if your organization doesn't think this, it needs to set out in detail um, with the Bank of England and with the Federal Reserve and the FDIC why that is so. And I think that you also need to invite those of us that are, including, if not me, people like Andrew Gracie, who are real experts in this field, and ask us to evaluate your work. I doubt very much, frankly, whether there lies a great deal behind assertions like that. Because if they're right, you should be pressing this at G20 level and G7 level, because it would mean that everything that we have said on this panel, including President Trichet, is profoundly wrong. I haven't heard Christine say that at all over the recent years. When I've talked to David, I haven't heard him say this. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm challenging you on the substance and I'm actually challenging you on the policy um, debate um, as well, because I think there is nothing more serious, and I think in that sense, you're right to raise the issue. Let me, let me, yeah. let me, let me, just yeah. let me, let me make a very quick... Well, that's break, quite important for the media. I, the media presence... I, I'm sorry, I'm let's said. not engage in direct all right, dialogue. All right, all right. So, uh, Pablo and Stephen. No, 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 just a very, very quick uh, element to add to, to what uh, Paul has said, is that uh, the FSB is evaluating yeah. the TILAC. Yeah, uh, right, right now. So let's wait. Right, right. <laughs> to no, I, of the I, I evaluation in order to, 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 to give an answer, a proper, a proper answer. Well, I think where it's very easy to agree is that if one of these institutions starts to fail, that there's no politician on the face of the earth, that if they believe that the institution's failure is going to bring down their financial system, there's no politician that will not bail this institution out. Absolutely. Okay? Yes, the question is, I agree with that. The, the question is whether or not we have a system, as Paul put it, where they have an alternative that, they, that is in fact palatable and that they trust. And that, I think, is exactly as Pablo said, the FSB and Claudia Buch, who, I, who was here yesterday, I don't think she's here today, is, uh, is, is running a, um, an evaluation of the too big to fail. So I think that that's really where we need to go. Do we have a, um, a sufficiently uh, powerful uh, way of uh, ba bailing in systemically important insolvent entities in a crisis? My belief is no, we don't. It is precisely what uh, has to be, to be checked. But I mean, there are degrees in, the, in, in crisis. Oh, and, sure. uh, I think, obviously, we, we cannot exclude, of course, uh, an absolute drama. And experience has also demonstrated that whatever you have devised and designed ex ante, you find out what has to be done in the circumstances, at least it is what we had experienced in the, in the last crisis. But if we could go up to 
the ranking of everything and the algorithm which permits to have some kind of consensus on the way you deal with such events, of course, it would oversimplify the life of those who would have taken, who will be responsible for taking these terrible the political decisions. Uh, we had a question over there. Yeah. Please. Thanks. Uh, Jack Schickler from MLEX. Um, <clears throat> in a letter that was published today, uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, who is hoping to be the next EU Commissioner for Financial Services, said uh, the EU will implement Basel III, I'm going to quote, in a way that preserves European specificities and the diversity of the EU banking sector. <clears throat> Does that kind of language uh, worry you? Does, uh, does it make you uh, worry in particular that the EU will seek to continue the loopholes it's had in the Basel system uh, that favor its own banking sector? Um, and what would the consequences of that be? Good questions. Pablo. Of course, I'm not going to interpret what uh, yeah. others uh, have said. Uh, I would just uh, stick to what I've said in my initial intervention, is that all jurisdictions all jurisdictions should implement Basel III in a full, timely, and consistent manner. Yeah, this is simple and clear. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Question. Yeah, in, in the session on the, on the uh, possible problems of the financial system globally that we just have, I, I'm, I'm a little bit astonished not to hear anything about China. I mean, we are thinking about where could the next crisis come from? We're asking ourselves, what have we achieved? What are our problems? I, I guess when you take Paul's impressive list of grievances, um, this is really a description of China. Plus, you add in, in uh, transparent state um, banking, you add excessive leverage, you add uh, excessive digitalization, including uh, riskiness of cybercrime, as we learned mm -hmm. this morning, etc. So you add all the stuff that comes to your mind during these uh, one and a half days. Uh, isn't that something which should make us think about how do we address the next financial crisis? In particular, sort of a question of is it better to do more in terms of, in fact, even more in terms of international cooperation, or maybe they even maybe there were even reasons for sort of ring fencing. Let's make sure that if there's a major problem in China, it doesn't hit us too badly. Stimulating question. <laughs> Who wants to answer? China is participating, of course, in all your meditation, uh, Pablo. And yes, and of course, and, uh, it's, a, it's a member of the, of, the Basel, of the Basel Committee. Well, indirectly, I was uh, mentioning China, and it was one of my slides when commenting on the on the shadow banking. Mm. Uh, you made also the point. Uh, uh, well, the role of the shadow banking in China is probably higher than in other. Uh, and yes. uh, by the way, this has been given accepted by the authorities, by the yes. by the Chinese uh, authorities. No? Uh, so it's not only the level of debt, but also the distribution of debt uh, of this debt between official banks, let's say, or, and, 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 shadow, and, and shadow banks. So, and of course, given the importance of the Chinese economy for the whole and the world economy, uh, it's, yeah. it's true that uh, I it think can, in it terms can be systemic. of having a crisis, I think China must be a leading candidate in, you know, at some time in the not too distant future. But uh, the spillover through the capital account. Yeah. will be limited yeah. because of uh, the capital controls that they have. So there will be transmission, of course, through real economic activity and trade links and everything else. But um, I think that the Chinese financial crisis would first and foremost be a Chinese financial crisis uh, rather than something that would have the kind of international repercussions uh, that we saw during the, during the great financial crisis. Yeah, as long as the renminbi is not a convertible currency, part of the international monetary system, we, we are a little bit uh, isolated. But the time will come quite oh, rapidly, yeah, no, in my absolutely. opinion. Well, if you make the currency convertible, you'll probably see, if you were to do that tomorrow, you would have a financial crisis in China tomorrow. <laughs> because <laughs> the, the exodus would be yeah. just enormous. So, probably. so I, I think it would be also be a crisis in the rest of the world, yeah, by, yeah, but it, uh, it by would, definition. It would, it would, yeah. it would. <laughs> but, but only but, but, open up. But so. nevertheless, which uh, remains uh, 
probably, extraordinarily likely, when time comes, is that progressively, of course, the RMB will become a convertible a currency, example. and we would be in a different universe. Uh, it's a question of time, maybe a long time, perhaps, fortunately, a long time, for the reason of transition, cost of the transition that you mentioned. Other questions? Yeah, madam. Yeah, I am of the, I agree with you. I mean, we have advanced a lot. This is my idea. But I agree with Paul Tucker about CCPs. I am really surprised that uh, we have not advanced on the resolution of CCPs because it's not that they are big to fail. It's that they are huge to fail. And, <laughs> uh, uh, and also, it's not the only that they are huge to fail, but if one of them fails, then the whole system, because the interconnections are so big, especially with banks, uh, that uh, the problems are going to be very, very big. So my question is, why do you think that we have not advanced on that? Well, I, I think it's partly because quite a number of important supervisors and regulators of clearing houses have a position that recovery will always work um, and that resolution is essentially unnecessary. Um, and I think it's, I think it, that's more in the United States in Washington. And you can see traces of that in the, um, the response of the former chair of the CFTC to a paper that the Systemic Risk Council published on, on that. In Europe, I think it's slightly different. I, I was, this isn't a secret, although it's not well known. I was a consultant about four years ago, I think, to the European Commission on the work they were doing on a directive for resolving CCPs. And the then commissioner had a view, which I think was completely understandable, that he wanted Europe to move in tandem with the United States. I think that, you know, if, if you were made commissioner with that brief tomorrow, I think that would be your first thought and to work it out through the FSB. I think it's less easy to explain why there hasn't been a kind of global um, breakthrough I won't bore you with the technical details, but some technical details tend to get thrown up, and for what it's worth, I, I think they're either invalid or can easily be um, resolved. I think there hasn't been enough political pressure. I, w I would encourage the ESRB to try and get... When, when Jean-Claude was, was chair of the GHOS and Mario was chairing FSB, I was, chair, I was chairing CPMI, as it's now called, on one of the FSB groups. One of the tricks, and I mean tricks in a grown-up way, is to put reports up to the G20 summit that then give you instructions to get on with your work in various areas. And um, I, I, would, I don't know to what extent ESRB can get the EU and the FSB to, to constrain people a bit to have a, to have a breakthrough in this area. Because if ever there is a problem, yeah. It will just, I mean, there will be no forgiveness. It's, I simply don't understand it. But this is bureaucratic infighting and some, and some attempts to be global. So some goodwill and some ill will um, coming together. So I have a quick comment on this. I think that, I mean, what amazes me is um, for, 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 you know, all of you who uh, here in this kind of, uh, in, in, in this kind of gathering, I think, will will recall the episode now only a year a year ago of NR Oss and the yeah. <laughs> and and the and the bankruptcy um, and and the, the the what you should what we should have learned from that <laughs> and we didn't is the way in which these things are transmitted quickly. So what happened was that this one guy managed to build up a position. He went bankrupt, and leaving behind losses of roughly 100 million euros. And, um, and those losses were then immediately, immediately distributed in the form of a capital call to the clearing members of this little exchange. And what we should have learned from that is that these, 
that first of all, this can happen, <laughs> and secondly, that when it does happen, it is transmitted very quickly to the clearing members, and so if it was very large, it would be transmitted and it would cross borders, because of course the clearing members are not just in yeah. one jurisdiction. Okay. Now, why is this, why have we done nothing? I am actually way more cynical than, well, Paul's pretty cynical, but I'm even more cynical, which is I think that these <laughs> things, because we allow these things to be private for-profit operations. Oh, that too, yeah. I think, I think that's the first thing we have to change. Then we can start arguing about how to structure them. But the first thing is, if you are private, then of course you don't want to have any capital. <laughs> right? Because, it's a, because your return on equity for your owners becomes low as, as you increase the capital. So, so that, that seems to me to be the first place to start. That's where I would start, is get rid of private ownership. Yeah, the, the fact is that de facto, these are utilities and uh, yeah. yes. we it's don't the, recognize But not the euro. Yeah. <laughs> other questions, other remarks, other comments? No? Meaning that you... Ah, one question over there, please. It's very far over there. Yeah, far away. See anything. Far away. <laughs> it's very dark. <laughs> Thank you very much for your interesting remarks. Um, following up on the CCP question, um, if one were to actually um, nationalize or make them public entities, um, at the end, if a CCP were to fail, somebody would have to bear the brunt of the loss or mm -hmm. ta take the bill. So as long as they are um, private entities, Daryl Duffy has put out a proposal where you would do initial margin haircutting. So the losses yeah. that go in excess of the default fund and excess of the, um, the capital of the CCP, which isn't intended to be, to be losses, sorry, would be distributed similar to a bail-in of the banks, it would be distributed to the members. Yeah. If the entities were public, um, wouldn't that incentivize actually um, the use of public funds rather than the use of private funds? Can I respond to this? Please, so, please, please. so, so the, this is the technical issue I was alluding to and that I think there's a solution to. So there is an argument that haircutting initial margin or haircutting variation margin is highly pro-cyclical. Um, except to the extent that the failure of the CP CCP comes completely out of the blue like a sunspot. If it doesn't, if there's any notice at all, um, people will cut their positions right. in the CCP or take opposite positions, which could exacerbate the market crisis, which has given rise to the pressure on the CCP. Um, the way around this, I personally believe, and so my pers personal position is that this is a good solution. The SRC's position is that this is something worth thinking about, that's subtly different and importantly different, um, is that what should happen is that CCPs should issue bonds which um, the owner has first call on, they can subscribe to them. If they don't, they should go, they sh the clearing members should have to subscribe to them. And the value of the bonds would be some slow moving average of the initial margin positions of individual clearing members and the default members. So it's the same economics, for, or the same financial hit for the clearing members who would become equity holders, but the pro-cyclicality is removed because the bond is just something that they have got and can't do anything about because of the slow moving um, average. I said it would be a bit technical. Um, but this, you know, that may be a, a bad idea, but it's, it's the, the point about the pro-cyclicality has stopped people pursuing this variation margin haircutting um, thing, and somebody's got to come up with something else. Thank you very much, Paul. I see that the audience is fully informed, fully aware of all the, the hard work which remains to be done, Pablo and in all domain, and I have to thank the panelists very, very much. They were extremely good and eloquent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting presentation.